case you might have been wondering what that was in your first song because of the regulations that they place upon us we have to have a smoke alarm on each one of the air conditioning units and for some reason one of the smoke alarms went off so that's why when I finally recognized what it was I rushed back there to turn off the unit but it's probably in fact I'm sure that it's a false alarm we heard them the other night I think going off or I didn't but someone else did so that's what that was and we'll have those people back out to take a look at it and make sure everything's fine and find out why it's giving us those alarms last Sunday morning we started looking at apathy and it is expressly or aptly expressed by the answer that one student gave to a teacher when they asked what's the greatest problem in the church today and they answered I don't know and I don't care it just so happened that this past week that someone on one of the lists that I read asked basically that question what do you see as being some of the major problems within the church today and so I got on and I quickly stated I don't know and I don't care just so happened that that question came out at the same time that dealing with this subject but many times well we're all going to face struggles and temptations and we're all going to be at one time or another get discouraged and doubt will creep in and we need encouragement Paul after establishing the congregations on his first missionary journey he along with Barnabas went right back to those congregations to confirm the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that they through much tribulation must enter into the kingdom or enter into the kingdom of God Acts 14 and verse 22 so he recognized the the immediate problem of discouragement and thus apathy and so he goes back through those places to encourage them to continue in the faith don't allow yourself to become apathetic toward things of the of, of a spiritual nature don't let yourself become apathetic toward the church and for the Lord and his great sacrifice that he made because while we will face struggles within our life the way that we handle those struggles is going to determine our faith and James shows that in the first chapter of James so as we deal with apathy we need to remember from when we've fallen from whence we've fallen as we see in Revelation the second chapter in verse 5 we need to remember God's grace and God's mercy and we need to allow God's word to come back into our lives and to convict us we need to repent of the sin of apathy and that again in the church at Ephesus uh, Jesus tells them to repent and do the first works so he recognized that need to repent from their sins and return and do the first works recognizing those things that are foremost and putting those things within our life but now then, this morning and probably Lord willing next Sunday morning, I want us to look at defeating the sin of apathy. And the very first thing that we want to mention along that line is the renewing of godly priorities in our life. Paul would write in Ephesians the fifth chapter and verse 14, Wherefore he saith, 
Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Awake thou that sleepest. I wonder if when John gets to the point where he writes his letter, the book of Revelation, that those brethren that Paul was writing to and saying, Awake thou that sleepest. If they awoke at that time and went back to sleep. Or if they just never woke up. We don't know. But we do know the condition of the congregation at Ephesus, that those to whom Paul were, was writing, when John does write. And he tells them, you've left your first love. You need to repent. You need to remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. And then there's the warning, unless or I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So that's the condition that they were in. Paul is trying to prevent that condition. He's telling them, you need to wake up. It's easy for us to go to sleep, spiritually speaking. We get so involved in our society and within our life that we lose sight many times of the seriousness of Christianity. In Matthew, the 22nd chapter, Jesus gives a parable of one who's going to give a feast. And he tells the servants, go get the people who are invited. And it says in Matthew 22 and verse 5, But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. They made light of it. They didn't consider the seriousness of the situation. If you skip down a couple of verses to verse 7, he then adds, But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. They made light of it. They didn't consider the seriousness of the invitation that had been given unto them. So they just, oh well. That doesn't even indicate when it says that they made light of it. That they ridiculed it. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that they made fun of it. They didn't. It doesn't state that they were rebelling against the king. It only indicates they made light of it. How they went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and so forth. They went about their everyday lifestyle without taking into consideration the gravity of the situation. Of the king's invitation. That's the way in which they made light of it. They did not consider how important this was. Christianity requires our devotion and our dedication to God and to Christ. It demands that. Not just simply a uh, well, I'll be there maybe on Sunday morning and Sunday night, and I might even make Wednesday night here or there. It demands our dedication. It demands of our time. Yes, spending time not only in worship service, in study of God's Word, but also in activity. Those activities, that, yes, the elders arrange for us to engage ourselves in whether it be that Monday night visitation program, or whether it be a lectureship or a gospel meeting, or if they would decide that we're going to go out knocking doors, spending time involved in those things. But then our other everyday activity as well as far as our Christian life and going about doing good, helping people, teaching people the gospel of Christ, it demands our time that we spend time in Christianity. It demands our energy, our effort. We have to put forth an effort. Remember that individual who dies in the Lord, Revelation the 14th chapter and verse 13? 
That individual who dies in the Lord is blessed, but it says that his works do follow him. We are to be workers in the kingdom of God. Well, that's realizing the, that God comes first in our life. That we are to devote all of ourselves to Him. In Galatians, second chapter, and verse twenty, Paul would talk about, "I am crucified with Christ." Crucifixion was not simply an instrument of punishment. It was an instrument of punishment, but not simply that. You can punish someone without putting them to death. Crucifixion was to put someone to death. It was to execute them. You did not survive the ordeal. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. What is it? I've died in relationship to in my relationship with Christ. Now, and he recognized it's not a physical death, so he adds, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave Himself for me. I recognize that I'm still alive in this world, but I've turned my life over to Christ. Christ is living in me. In Philippians, the first chapter, in verse 20 and verse 21, Paul recognizes he is now in prison, going to stand trial before Nero, expects to be delivered from prison, but realizes Nero could put him to death. And he says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope. Now, as we also realize he expected to be released and not be put to death at this time. But that's not what his hope is. Notice, according to my expectation, earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my life, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. His hope was not simply he expected to be released, but he says my real hope is that it doesn't matter if I live or die, same situation is going to take place, and that's Christ is magnified by my life. That's the type of attitude that we're going to have to have as Christians. If we're going to be really what a Christian is not supposed to be, we're going to have to be glorifying and magnifying God as we live and as we die. doesn't matter which one takes place, whatever takes place, Christ is going to be magnified in my body. For me to live is Christ. And so as we go about our daily lives, we have to have God as the priority within our life. That God has to come first. And that's where many uh, Christians are falling down today. Because we have almost compartmentalized our lives. Well, I'll go to worship on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And while I'm here at this, at this worship service, I'm going to put on my coat of righteousness. But as I leave this building, now then I'm going to go into another area of my life. It's separate from my religion, which I do when I come here. And so when I go out from this place, I'm going to put on my business coat or my homemaker's coat or my at-home coat or my recreation coat. And each area of our life is compartmentalized where it's just we're that when we're there. And when we're over here, we're this. When we're over here, we're that. And when we come to this building, we're Christians. But the, for example, the recreation doesn't go over into the home. And the home doesn't go over into the work. And the work doesn't go over into religion. 
and Christianity. Each one of them are separate. That's the way many people have made their lives. And what Paul is saying and teaching us, and that we've got to do in order to really overcome apathy as far as Christianity is concerned, is to make Christ the priority, whether it's in recreation, whether it's in the home, whether it's in the workforce or the workplace. It doesn't matter where it is that Christ permeates our life totally and wholly. That in every area of my life, Christ is first. That I am seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness first and foremost within my life. And when we do that, we're going to, we're going to start defeating that sin of apathy. That's when we will awake to righteousness. And Christ will give us life. But second, is that we've got to return to faith in the Lord and not in ourselves. Those who become apathetic are many times self-reliant, self-sufficient, have an arrogant viewpoint of life. They might not present it that way, but basically what they have stated is that I don't need God. I don't need religion. I don't have time for that because I've got more important things to do. It's reported that, uh, well, I won't mention his name because I don't have the quote exactly, but uh, one of the richest men in the world once stated that he had better things to do with his time than to sit an hour at a worship service. Well, that's arrogance. But notice the relationship to religion and his arrogance. I have better things to do with my time. I'm more important than just than God. I, uh, who cares? God's insignificant in my life. And so actually these two ideas go together. Because recognizing God first in our life and true priorities within our life is going to cause us to realize our humility before God. These individuals that become apathetic, many of them do so because of that high esteem of themselves, but also low view of everyone else. Everyone else is insignificant. I'm the one who's important. It is aptly described by Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 when he says, For dare we now make, or for dare we not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with the, some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. These individuals say, Well, look at oh so and so over here. I'm better than he is. And I'm better than old Joe Blow over here. And he's saying, that's not wise. And he says, we're not going to do that. What good is it accomplished? Except to make one arrogant and apathetic within his life. We need to remember Jesus along this line. If anyone had the right really to be arrogant, don't you think it was the one who is God manifested in the flesh? If someone had the right to have a high esteem of themselves, it would have been Jesus. But he, he didn't show that type of an attitude. He had a humble attitude. A serving attitude. He said, I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Give my life as a ransom for many. That was his attitude. And yet he could have come as one to be ministered unto because he was and is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
But we need to think back upon our Lord and His life. The Hebrews writer would state in Hebrews 12 and verse 3, For consider him that hath endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. You think back to Christ and what He endured and the life that He led. If you don't do that, if you don't center your minds on Christ, then here's the result. You're going to be weary and you're going to faint in your mind. What is that? That's being apathetic within your life. And so we think back to Christ and the life that He led. We think back to the sufferings that He endured. We think back to the death that He died upon Calvary's tree to save us from sin. And it helps us and it provokes us to continue on in faithfulness to God. And then, yes, we must, very simply, we have to rely upon the Lord. In 1 Peter the 5th chapter, in verse 6 and verse 7, Peter says, To humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. As we introduce this, we talked about the struggles that we all have, that we're going to face within this life. And how we deal with those struggles and those temptations is going to determine our faith according to James, the first chapter. Notice, as Peter deals with this idea, humble yourselves unto God. He will exalt you. Then casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. What is it? Here is the struggles in life that you're going to face. Those struggles, yes, that will cause one to become apathetic if allowed. And he's saying instead of trying to bear all of that by yourself, and becoming crushed under the weight of that load, just cast your care upon Him. Realize your need for help. That's relying on the Lord. Realizing my need for help, and thus I cast my care upon Him. Those burdens and those temptations and those troubles and trials that will come our way, I just say, here they are, Lord. Help me through these times. Notice uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians 5th, the 12th chapter. It says that Paul had a thorn in the flesh. What that thorn in the flesh was, we don't know. Some have jokingly said it, it was his wife. That her name was Grace. And you'll see the application of that in a second. But uh, in reality, we don't know what it was. But he says, for this thing, whatever it was, I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient unto thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Three times he prayed the Lord, let this thing depart from me. You know, I can imagine if it were me like that. And I would rationalize, you see, Lord, if you will take this away, I can be much more effective in the work of the Lord, in your work. I'll be able to do this, and I'll be able to do that. I won't have to rely upon this individual, that individual. And so I need this taken away. And it would be, I can do this, and I can do, I can, 
I will be worshipped. Me, myself, I, and we become self-sufficient. And that's why God is saying to him, what I have given unto you, that's the idea of my grace, a gift that God has given unto us, is sufficient for you. You don't need anything else. You don't need this taken away. For when you're weak, then you'll be strong. Why? Because then you'll be relying upon God and not yourself. And so many times it's, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be the strong one. And we fail to humble ourselves under God's hand. Submit to Him and His will. And realize that there is where our strength really comes from. And not self. A third thing that we must do to overcome, to defeat apathy within our life is to renounce sin in our life. In 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verses 1 and verse 2, Paul writes, Therefore, seeing that we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking after craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Here is this that God has commissioned us to do. Here is this ministry that we have. I just make an application. Here is this Christianity that God has given unto us. He has commissioned us with being Christians. We have received His mercy as a result to be Christians. And so He says, we think not. Is that? I'm not going to become apathetic. I'm not going to become loosey-goosey with all of this and just uh, become lazy with it. I'm going to work. I'm going to continue in the work. But in order to do that, notice, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty and walking in craftiness and handling the Word of God deceitfulness. In other words, I'm going to overcome these sins. I'm going to over, try and overcome all sin in order to live the Christian life. In order to fulfill this ministry as Paul is talking about it here with himself. If he did not overcome these sins within his life, or these sins, then he would not be able to fulfill that ministry. When we fail to overcome sin within our life, we're not going to be able to live the Christian life. We're not living the Christian life. But the presence of sin within our life does cause apathy. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew the 24th chapter and verse 12. While this has specific reference to the times of the destruction of Jerusalem, yet the principle is still there. He says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because sin is running rampant, People becoming apathetic. They're no longer fervent in their service to God. And so we've got to cast off sin. Notice in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, great chapter on faith in which he identifies what faith is as we start with that. <clears throat> then from there, he begins from almost creation. Now it begins with creation and our through faith understanding that the worlds were made by God. And then he goes to Abel offering a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And Enoch and his godly life. He was translated so that he would not see death. And how that by faith Noah moved with fear, built an ark 
to the saving of his house. Abraham. And he goes on through the, the heritage of the Jews and the great men, as we call them, Hall's Fame of Faith. Or Hall, the Hall of Fame of Faith because of their great faith that they demonstrated. When he gets to the conclusion of that, we go into chapter 12. And he says, Wherefore, seeing also we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That great cloud of witnesses, all of these individuals who had great faith in the Old Testament times, we're compassed about with that. He tells us, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let, let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down uh, on the, the right hand of the throne of God. Notice, look at this these all of these great individuals of faith. And because that you lay aside the sin, the weight that does so easily beset us, he uses the figure of a runner. And as that runner trains many times, and in fact maybe some of y'all in training for running and such, you would put by weights and you'd put them on your wrist and put them on your ankles and you would run with those weights. But when the time for the race came, you took off the weights. Why? Because they'd slow you down. That's what he's saying. You put off the weight of sin. That sin will hinder your Christian life so that you cannot be that man of that great man of faith that we see in chapter eleven. So you lay it aside, and then you can run with patience that race. The only way to run the Christian race is to lay sin aside, to cast it off from us. Paul would write in Romans 13th chapter and verse 11. And that knowing the time that now is, that it is now a high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. We're all headed to eternity. We're all headed to our death. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how young you are, you're headed toward your death and toward eternity. The only way that that race to eternity can be successful is when we lay aside the sin that will weigh us down. To awake out of sleep so that we can live the type of life that God would have us to live. In Ephesians 4th chapter, verses 20 through verse 24, that Paul writes, But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard Him and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off the former, or put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You put off that former lifestyle. You put off the sin and wickedness of that life. And you put on the new man. That new man is a lifestyle of living holy and righteous before God. And you remove anything that might cause you to be lost. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus emphasizes the importance of our view to eternity 
and our putting off of sin and anything that would hinder our faithfulness to God when He says in verses 29 and verse 30 of Matthew 5 that if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. How important is it? It's so important that you remove anything that would cause you to be lost. Cast it from you because eternity is far too long. Hell is far too hot Far too much of a torment. And heaven is too blessed to miss. But that decision is ours. As to whether we allow ourselves to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ and upon hearing His word, believing it, repenting of our sins, and making the confession that I believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of the living God, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. That's that time in which you're casting off that old conversation, that old manner of life, the old man. And you come up out of that watery grave of baptism. What is it? You put on that new man which is created in righteousness and true holiness. But if we allow sin to come back in, we allow apathy to come back within our life, then we're not running that race with patience. Endurance is a word that's actually used there. Let us run with patience. Let us run with endurance. In other words, you keep on keeping on. You go to the end. And as we approach that time of death, we can look back. And if we can say, I've run that race. I've kept the faith. I finish my course. Then we can say with Paul as he did in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and verse 8, that henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. Why? Because I have kept the faith. Because I finish my course. Because I run that race with endurance casting off all sin, all wickedness that might hinder my entering into heaven's home. If you're not a Christian this morning, why not become such? Obey that truth of God's Word to become that saved individual that has the hope of an eternity with God in heaven. If you've become a Christian that you've allowed sin to come back in your life, you haven't been zealous toward God you haven't been doing that which God wants you to do and haven't run with patience that race that is set before us, then return unto Him. Become zealous toward God once again. Put Him first within your life to overcome those sins and those, that apathy that so many times will take hold of us. If you need to come this morning, we would plead with you to come as we stand and sing this invitation song.